Well, welcome once again, another edition of the Here We Are podcast. And as last time, Jennifer's now with us. Uh, I bet she wishes she was because we're in Colorado. Yeah. That shade behind me there, if I'd open that up, you'd see a beautiful mountain range, still snow on the top here in Pagosa Springs, Colorado. This is Jason Rose, my very good friend, who's a worship leader at the church here in town, Grace, in Pagosa. We were just talking about, um, and I want to get into a little bit, Things like how do you prepare, how do you decide what songs you're going to lead, uh, theological considerations, musical mm -hmm. considerations, technical things. And you shared something that triggered a, a memory in my mind. When I was, I think it was between my sophomore and junior year in Bible college, I went over to a church, I won't say where, but um, in Wisconsin, <laughs> to be a, like intern youth pastor slash youth music kind of thing, but more a kind of intern youth pastor. But I sang a lot because I sang, played the guitar. The music director there would often involve me in the music, and I'd sing with the kids in the group mm -hmm. and so forth. And the pastor of that church, who was an excellent preacher, excellent expositor of Scripture, but he would, he would stop me many times, almost weekly, it seemed. And he'd say, Dallas, you need to develop your preaching ministry. That, that singing is good. Your music's good, but you need to develop mm -hmm. your preaching, mm -hmm. teaching ministry. Mm -hmm. And he just kept mm -hmm. on and on and on. And, and I appreciated it. He was encouraging mm -hmm. me. But he also didn't, he didn't, music wasn't a real priority. He kind of, yeah, whatever, you know, left it to the music director. One day he said the same thing, and I said, well, Pastor, hmm. you need to develop your singing ministry. <laughs> and he stopped, and he got, he got a little red. I thought, oh, man, I'm going to get fired here right now. And then he kind of smiled, and I, before he could say anything, I said, you know, I'm going to have a job for all of eternity. I'm going to be singing forever. But when this life is over, I don't think there'll be any preaching in heaven. And he just kind of laughed. He kind of didn't like it, but at the same point, he kind of laughed and got it. Well, we were talking about that because a lot of times, and I think even tragically, hmm. I have heard pastors say in conversations, oh, I don't know really anything about that music. I just let my worship leader take care of that. Right. And I often, hopefully lovingly, offer some corrective advice oh. there. Well, you need to. Right. Don't just sit there and say, I don't know anything about music. You learned how to read Greek and you learned how to preach sermons, right. everything else. You can learn a little bit about music. And I do believe that the worship leader, because I believe it's a pastoral calling, should learn uh, about the preaching aspect and <laughs> should be well equipped to communicate right. in a non-musical way as well. Because it's, it's not just about the music, it's about the opportunity to lead, to exhort, to edify through your, through your verbal uh, skills. So how do you... How, how would you describe, uh, and, and I know you've been at different churches, what have some of the relationships been like? How do you see that as, have you felt like you've had good situations yep. with senior pastors yep. uh, or like well, he does his thing and I do my thing? Right. Um, I think it's really all been, it's really all been good as far as the working together in crafting what the, you know, in a sense, in a, in a higher church, what the liturgy is going to be, but really what the flow of the morning is going to be. And that has been something that I have been tasked with, if you want, for over 20 years of, and, and really it's a blessing. I've, I've worked with senior pastors who really crossed the board from, if you were here last week, the, um, the bigger church where there are six pastors on, on staff. And I learned very quickly there from the, the main lead speaking pastor who is an excellent orator. And I would, you required in a sense, it was where I sort of learned this to meet with him. And I loved it because this guy was, I mean, he could quote the Bible, quote C.S. Lewis, just a oh, fascinating theologian. But he wanted every song to wrap itself around the message yeah. or to expound upon the message or to, um, yeah, really just make whatever to highlight whatever yeah. his main point was. So it became, on one hand, this kind of fun task to go, oh, well, it's going to be on grace. Well, okay, now here's this set of worship songs. Right. And and let me say this, there's a 400 to 1,000 great worship songs that a person could choose every Sunday. Right. It's There's part of that personal relationship with God, devotional time with God, 
you know, that as you are talking with your, your lead pastor or your speaking team or whatnot, what's the, what's the series that you're in? What's the theme for that morning biblically? And how are you going to reinforce? That was the word I was thinking of earlier. How are you going to reinforce that truth? So from the very early on, it was a, very much an expectation. Um, I was still able to add in uh, songs that are just worshipful, that, that point themselves to God. But subsequently from there, then I would pursue a weekly meeting with my lead pastor, say, hey, I know we're in the series. Yeah. Where are you going exactly today? I know, I know we're going here, but kind of where, what's your main point? What, where, what's your application point right. that you want people to leave with? And if I can at least have a couple songs that God will lead me to, um, I'd love to do that. And we'll place them in such a way to reinforce the message. message. But as my wife will always encourage me as well, what are the songs and, and um, that are just simply pointing us to, to Jesus? And it doesn't have to necessarily correlate always with, with right. the message. But for me, it, it's been, I've just been able to be intentional uh, and, and really, here's the thing is, and I, I've said this before to young, younger worship leaders and worship pastors, I would just challenge you, you know, in that proverb says it takes a friend to be a friend, pursue your lead pastor. There's so many things that he is responsible for and doing, and you want his theological voice to be speaking into the life of the church and into, into you and helping guide, but you're going to find that it can actually be this kind of beautiful symbiotic partnership you might need to be the one though that pursues that and that's okay um but where you're 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 uh, you're you're kind of trying to hear where he's going right now we're in between lead pastors and so i have the the real honor if you want of 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 helping lead our speaking team so we are we're actually forecasting well this is my administrative nerd part of me we i were able to forecast this whole year of where we're going We've been going through a series called His Last Days. I got that idea somewhere. <laughs> now into what happened next after Easter. After that, we're going to be going through a, a spiritual formation. What does the Bible have to say about personal devotional life? Then we're going to be moving into the names of God. And then after that, it's the I Am Statements of Jesus. As a worship pastor, I love that because I can be prayerfully working um, some weeks in advance and thinking through yeah. what, what songs we're going to be maybe leading or presenting to the congregation. I know in, in <clears throat> actually just a little while today, as we're sitting here, you're going to be rehearsing with right. your worship team for this next Sunday service. How do you decide more, more technical logistical things right, right. when you're, you're thinking of, okay, I think these are the songs we're going to do and rehearse. We were talking earlier off camera, some of the songs that come to you or, or sometimes you, Ooh, that's a good song I heard on a record. I still say record or the radio or whatever. I still Internet. say CDs. Yeah, right. <laughs> it's all streaming. Or I go back to HS anyway. Um, a lot of times they're not in a key. The artist that's singing sounds great, right. but if you when you try to have the whole congregation sing in that key, they can't sing it. Right. So they have to make an adjustment. So one of the questions is, how do you determine that? Just technically, you look at a song. Mm -hmm. This isn't the key that's going to work. So how do you? deal with that? Do you then have to rearrange? Do you, are you musicians with number charts? Can you just right. you know, say, okay, we're going to do it in this key and lead? How do you choose, obviously, from what you've already said, lyrically? In fact, I think you were saying the other day there was a really good chorus that you maybe had led at one time, but you took out a certain, maybe the bridge of it because right. all uh, two-thirds of it's TV, great, yeah. but yeah, all of a sudden this didn't work. Yeah. I mean, it gets pretty tricky, yeah. but yeah, I think the soundness of the theology, you can't, you can't afford yeah. because music implants the message literally in a kind of a different part of the brain. Absolutely. And it's kind of like we were talking earlier, you know, you don't remember always we should, but what are, you know, what are the top 10 sermons you've heard last year? <laughs> I don't know, but what are the top, what are your top 10 favorite worship songs? And a lot of people, they list them right. Oh, I love this. I love this yep. because that music. So, what we're saying when we're singing has to be sound because it's mm -hmm. going to stick there. And I, I, I fear there are too many who don't take that consideration, you know, yeah. take that into consideration. But yeah. this is really important stuff. And I, I, you know, I think it's one of those things where just you and I resonate with that. And, and it's, and, and it's, we're both lovers of 
this band from is it Australia, an Anglican a group oh, called the, City of Light. City of Light, yeah. And there's one we we actually led it together this last weekend called Yet Not I, But Through Christ in Me. And I think it's, it's referencing, they say, over 248 scriptures alone, just in this one song. And so for me, those, hey, that's a gold mine, but it's only a gold mine if it's accessibly melodically. Um, right. Because if it's, so, and, and if it's accessible, as you were saying, how do you, um, if it's accessible key-wise. Right. I think there's a couple things that are just by nature got thrown to me because I'm a baritone now. I can sing, I'm a baritone tenor type of thing, but I'm not, um, I probably was not quite the tenor that you are. You know, you got a high range the, though the other day when you were singing. Well, my I'm goodness. <laughs> but I think where it is is that, and I also have a, a awesome wife, Heather, who is a worshiper at heart. And Who's from New Jersey. Who's you a wrong show? Say, what were you thinking? What's going on with that worship song? <laughs> no. Uh, <laughs> exactly. She's great. <laughs> yeah. I love her. Um, but she is just, a, she's a champion and a worshiper at heart. And she'll let me know, like, hey, that was not a great key. <laughs> you know? And uh, so there's that. There's, I'll try to answer this, the, the question, and how do I choose? We're having a rehe rehearsal tonight. How do we choose songs? How do we choose the key that they're in? Again, this is something that I spoke at our EFCA conference uh, some months back, and you're not doing anybody a favor if you're leading songs that only like the sopranos and tenors can sing. Right. Really, we're, we aren't. There are different realms of things, you know, to perform and minister and to engage. But this is. I mean, I've been accused in the past. Well, you're you're, you're campfire worship leader. <laughs> That's a compliment because that means people are singing right. along. And so how are you helping people sing along? Well, one right. of them is the key. And I, we have Nicole and Denise who are on our team, um, Nicole Cotts and Denise Chaney, and both of them are, forgive me if I'm saying this wrong, but I think they're both altos. Uh -huh. And so what I will say, A, people on our team can suggest songs. It doesn't mean we'll always do them, but both Denise and Nicole have suggested songs that now have become really foundational songs in our church. But I'll say to them, you pick the key. What's going to be a good key for you to lead? Yeah. And knowing as altos, it's actually going to be keys. I'm finding more and more. Don't worry about that. It has to be in that original key. Right. Um, but my wife, again, will give me the feedback. She'll hey, that was actually a great key. We could all sing. Yeah. And then if you're sensitive as a worship pastor, too, you're going to also know when you're leading a song and everybody's just, you know, right. you know, you know keeping their mouth shut. Um and part of that can be too. I, I look in what's the key, and I'm a sucker for melody. I'm, I'm not. I, I, I we're we're both musicians, and we appreciate some really fancy, difficult music. Right. But but in the worship setting, it's it's a it's a more simple application of things. So, is this are these things that people can actually sing along to, or that they've got to work at home forever to right. to be able to sing along to? So. That it's in a good key, that's an important thing. Um, that's that it's theologically correct. I will change words because why not? Um, if it if it feels like this is a little bit theologically off, I'll and I don't want to give an example because I don't want to point out you know <laughs> some of these bad theological worship song, but I can think of them right now if where I'll just change a word and now, yeah, it, uh, well, no, should I, yeah, anyway. <laughs> No. Okay. <laughs> I can think of one song. Um, and then as far as how do we choose? Well, again, this is that vaporous a little bit. What is the Holy Spirit? Where are you at in your devotion with God? Where, as you are preparing for that Sunday morning, as you're looking at the passage that's going to be spoken, right. what are the songs that, God's bringing, that God is bringing to your heart and through other folks on your team and that you know Historically, people are going to sing along to. And then for me, lastly, I'll say this. I do try to have one hymn. It doesn't always work. But I, I said years ago, I want my kids to be my age and know the great yeah. hymns of the faith. Yeah. So make, make faith, amazing grace. You know, uh, Lord, I need you every hour. Be thou my vision, how great thou art. The list goes on. Yeah. As well as now songs that seem ancient, but they're from right. the 70s and 80s, right. the contemporary Um yeah, in my daily devotion, someone asked me, I don't remember what the setting was, just within the last 
Oh, it was at, I was at a pastor's conference, kind of a retreat, just eight or nine pastors out in Tennessee and just interacting. Some of the guys were kind of burned out and going through some stuff. And uh, someone asked me about my devotional life. What, what do you do for your devotional life? And mm-hmm. I said, well, I, I read two, at least two devotionals usually. Actually, the one I read, and this sounds funny, but I read Mile Markers, which I wrote oh, yeah. two, three years ago. And part of the reason I knew that is because after writing 365 devotionals, I don't remember what I wrote. Oh, right. So I want to refresh, okay, w- was this good, was it? But the other thing is I know my children, my grandchildren, friends who are reading this, I want to, I want to think about, okay, they're going to read this today. I wonder how that's going to affect their life, knowing mm-hmm. what they're going through. So I read that. Then I read either Spurgeon's Morning and Evening, uh, My Atmosphere's Highest, Streams in the Desert, Tozer, I'm going yeah. through this year, Tozer on the Holy Spirit for leadership. It's for pastors. I'm just a big Tozer fan. Mm-hmm. But then I, I read five hymns in a old Methodist hymnal that Leonard Ravenhill, uh, actually oh, his family, yeah. totally. gave to me because I did the music at his funeral. It, it doesn't even have notes, it's just words. And most mm-hmm. of the hymns are, of course, Wesley, Isaac Newton, uh, oh boy, some of the names, uh, <laughs> my mind goes blank. Names that, when I look at the hymn, I've gotten, I've gotten so good at it because I'm at 700 and something now. Oh, wow. I, I read five hymns every day, all the verses. Mm-hmm. And I start to get the flow. I know a Char- I know it's a Charles Wesley hymn before I ever see his name. At right. The I know it's an uh, Isaac. Uh, there's a Watts and there's a Isaac Newton. Isaac Newton. Newton. Yeah. And uh, long, there's a Longfellow. There's a right Robinson. Uh, yeah. Yeah. There's just some old. And they're so Fanny Crosby. Rich. Yeah. She's in there. Uh, named. And then there's names I've never heard of. A lot of them are back in the 1600s, 1700s. Right. Uh, just but amazing theology. And when I read those. Yeah. And I'm not one of those that thinks, well, you need to be singing the hymns. But I do think it's criminal. Yeah. I would say borderline criminal that our young people grow up within the walls of the church and have no sense of musical heritage whatsoever within the church. Do you have to love this? Do you have to identify with it culturally? Well, this isn't the kind of music I listen to. But if you don't have this voice, these words speaking into your life, man, you're, you're really missing yeah. something. It's just so important. So true. I mean, I think of songs like I Stand Amazed. Or oh, and then I read the Bible song. after all that. I just want to make sure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then another book. Yeah. <laughs> no. Yeah, I think of songs like Jesus Paid It All, yeah. uh, hymns, or it's either called My Savior's Love, or I Stand Amazed in the yeah. Presence of Jesus the Nazarene, um, and wonder how he could love me, a sinner, condemned, unclean. Oh, how marvelous. Oh, yeah. how wonderful. And my song shall ever be. Yeah. Oh, how Marvelous, oh, how wonderful is my Savior's love for me. And there, there is something about the, there's something about the mel- melody that it's, it's, it doesn't feel contemporary, but it's, but it works. But it yeah. works. Yeah. And, and, and that, you said it earlier, there's something about the vehicle of melody, the vehicle of music yeah. that it, 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 it sets in your soul in not a better, but in a different way than make the application point for the scripture that morning, the same way that the Holy Spirit can, can kind of set your heart on fire when you read a scripture. Um, and, and you know, God is, is speaking that, um, or, you know, right to you. There is something about the vehicle of music that yeah. God created it. Well, and, the neat, and the neat thing is, I know you know this better than I do in that, the context of worship leading, but I have a personal, I always kind of cringe a little bit, not every time, but almost every time, Someone takes a great hymn and they change it all up musically to quote, make it more contemporary, more palatable. You know, it's worked for a couple hundred years and all of a sudden, uh, well, we got to fix it. It's not working, whatever. The the neat thing is a lot of times just the instrumentation makes it contemporary, makes it, Mm -hmm. in other words, pipe organ is not a real popular instrument. I love a great pipe organ. Someone that can really play a pipe organ, that's a a majestic, marvelous instrument. But we don't use that in church, by and large, anymore. So why force the issue? Well, we're going to start playing the pipe organ. Yeah. But if you take an old hymn, and now you've got an acoustic guitar, and you've got some percussion, and you've got some instrumentation mm-hmm. that represent the sounds you're hearing in music today, mm-hmm. that makes a transition into a contemporary feel. Because a lot of those, like the song you pointed out, I couldn't improve on that melody. It doesn't need any no. tweaking melodically, but the instrumentation will put it in a new yeah. key. And sometimes, and I and I won't even debate whether I'm going to share which ones these are. But there are there are those new versions of the hymns, and I I can't think of one that it improved on 
the singability or the or the melody, if you want. Now, maybe the arrangement feels more contemporary, right, right. but there is something jarring. And I, I've, I've noticed this in processing this with some of the folks on our praise team as well. Uh, they think, yeah, you know, let's just, let's sing it the way it, that it was. Right. Not because that's better, but that, that there, there's, a, there's a peacefulness in it. And rather than having to wonder about well, am I going to come in wrong or right to what, right. you know, because very often, and, and okay, I'll be cynical. All that that half the time, you know, change the melody around and then change the syncopation. Right. Well, I mean, then then it becomes a new song. Yeah. And uh, I just, so I do hymns the way the old melody was. Yeah. Well, and the one thing I've noticed <clears throat> time and time again, and sometimes I think, I probably shouldn't do this, but I'm in a church service all the time. It's not in my own church, but when I'm visiting and they're doing their corporate time of praise and worship, I look at the people. I want to know, how are they responding? Yeah. How is this working? And when I see, literally, no exaggeration, two-thirds of the congregation is not singing. Something Because is, either yeah. it's non-singable, it's, it's pitched out of their range, or mm -hmm. the worship team, and this is often the case too, they're performing. It's like, this is a concert, and hey, listen to these vocal licks, and the leader is singing all kinds of extra vocal licks. That doesn't help me sing along with you at all. But what I've noticed is in those settings, when it happens, if they're doing real contemporary, it's kind of performance, they got it cranked up. And I know I'm an older guy, so forgive me. But two, you know, if two thirds of the congregation are just standing there and they're not singing, something's wrong somewhere, at least investigate and figure that out. Yeah. But then they'll throw, all of a sudden, maybe just out of a sense of obligation, well, now let's sing it as well. Or, or some, and everybody's singing. Yeah. Not only are the, it's not about just the older yeah. people, the young people are singing. Yeah, Why? Yeah. Because they know that song. Yeah. They know that song. Familiarity, and that's why I go, why change it? Yeah. When you change yeah. a song that I've known all my life, it is, just what you said is a great term, it's jarring. And all of a sudden, I'm kind of knocked out of the worship realm. I'm a, I'm accosted by this, why did you change it? That's not the melody. <laughs> right. yeah. What What is that, yeah. you know? What's the upside of that? What's the payoff? Now, that's, again, that's me. Yeah. I'm probably being a little, I'm, I'm sure we could have someone sit down here and say, well, here's the reason we did that. It'll work just fine. Well, yeah, the idea may be that, the, that it can take an old truth that you maybe have gotten used to. For example, we had, uh, we had a part of our, member of our speaking team, Trip Allman, uh, from Summit Ministries come and speak two weeks ago, and he preached the Great Commission. And at the very beginning of his message, he said, now, okay, I want to do something here because we very quickly... You could start just this, these words are just going to go right over your head because you've heard the Great Commission so many times. So I'm just going to challenge you. Pretend you've never heard it again. Pretend you are or not pretend, but place yourself in the context of that yeah. verse. Place your context in you know, with the being with the disciples. And so maybe there are times where, you know, for a point, but the only time where, and, and this is maybe because I have done it where I will take some old Christmas hymns and just for fun, redo them. And one of them that I, I always liked the words, but O Come, O Come, Emmanuel. Oh, yeah. It's very happy words, all minor chords. Right. O oh, Come, O oh, Come. <laughs> you know, I mean, I'm joking. It's a beautiful song, but I just made it all. Uh, other than dispatch or disperse the gloomy clouds of night, then I left that minor. But everything else I, I just put into a major key. And it, it, it really yeah. actually, for me, just maybe more fit the words. Right. But that was just for fun for me. It wasn't yeah. that I was going to force this on you know, the world to you know, change that whole song. Right. Um, no, for if it's not broke, don't fix it. But if it is broke, change a word or two. And that's a scripture, I think. It's in there somewhere. <laughs> it is. Yeah. In that, a 4 or 3, I like it. Yeah. Well, I hope, I hope this has maybe encouraged and, and helped someone who maybe struggles in these areas or has opinions that you feel like, am I the only one that feels like this? Hmm. Uh, probably not. We don't pretend to be two people who know everything about it or our opinions are more right than anybody else. We, I just wanted to have a discussion about it because it is such an important aspect of ministry in our lives and especially in the corporate worship setting of, of churches. And we both have seen so many violations of what true pure praise and worship mm. should be you see ego get in the way sometimes where you know it's more about a performance and showing off your talent than it is i mean 
if, if there's, I think of uh, Rick Warren's uh, book, uh, was it Purpose Driven Life? The opening line is, and, and I've often said, it could have just had that one line between the two covers and that's the book. And it says, it's not about you. Right. Period. Right. I don't agree with everything Rick Warren says and is about. I think he's a probably good brother and all that. I don't know him, never met him. But I love that line. It's not about you. And boy, if every worship leader could kind of stamp that on their forehead, it's not about you. It's not about your talent. It's yeah. not about your ability. Well, hope that's helpful to you. And we've enjoyed this very much. <laughs> Look forward much. to your comments. <laughs> yeah, maybe so. <laughs> but we'll see you again on the Here We Are podcast down the road. Maybe Jennifer will be with us next time. We hope. God bless. Thank you. <laughs>